Goldman Sachs gets a technological Heisman during a treasury auction, we're playing Investing Chicken with Bank of America, and we're looking back at some of the biggest stories of the week. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Copenheffer, and right here next to me is David Hansen. David, John Goslin of John and Kate Plus 8 is now waiting tables. When your stardom ends, when, when this show is over and you're no longer the, the, the big financials guy, what are you going to fall back on? Uh, how about some landscaping? Be outside, get some exercise, get a tan. Get a tan. I a tan, need it. Get I a need tan, the tan, yeah. so not waiting tables. That, that nice bright orange shirt would look good with a, with a farmer's tan, right? It. All right. We've got a great show today. We've got some investing chicken, like, I've, like I said. We're going to look back at the week's news, but we're going to start off with Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett and Brian Moynihan, Bank of America's CEO, were speaking at Georgetown yesterday. And uh, here's the, the headline from Bloomberg. Buffett says Federal Reserve is greatest hedge fund in history. David, you are so critical of the Federal Reserve. And here is Warren Buffett saying that they are the greatest hedge fund in history. I'm not critical in terms of I, I don't agree with what they're doing, but I'm, I'm critical that investors shouldn't be waiting every single second to see what the Fed does and what they say. And if you listen to Buffett's comments, he was along those same lines. He said, yeah, it's interesting. They're making a lot of money for the Treasury. He, what, he didn't say, boy, I'm really worried about my investments because of the taper. He said, hey, it'll be interesting to watch. So you and Warren Buffett are on the same page. Yeah, we talked last night. Well, one of the, one of the things that I, that I took away from, from what, he was, what he was saying there, and this is from the Bloomberg article, was how, he, how unconcerned he is about the Fed unwinding its big positions. Uh, he said, the Fed is under no pressure, none whatsoever, to have to deleverage, so it can pick its time, and if you have somebody wise in there, and I think Bernanke is wise, and I certainly expect his successor to be, it can be handled but it is something that's never quite been done on this scale. It will be interesting to watch. There's Buffett for you. Exactly. All right, moving on to our next headline, going over to the Wall Street Journal. Got another trading glitch. Glitch blocked Goldman at Treasury auction. So it's not on Wall Street this time. And it's interesting because I think a couple weeks ago, the SEC came out and said, boy, technology really needs to get better on Wall Street. And now it's the government where technology and their trading operations or their auction operations are a little bit fuzzy. So Goldman was rejected. They wanted some three-year notes. They didn't get it, so they got more six-year notes. The Treasury kind of settled up on that. Three months, six months. Three months, six months. Did I say Short, year? You said a year. year. Shorter duration. Month, month, You're month. putting them way no, out no, 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 no. of the scale. Um, so yeah, just interesting that it's not uh, always on Wall Street here. Well, it's, it's not a huge, huge deal for Goldman, but it does stink for them to have to go, go to their clients and say, oh yeah, those three month notes that we promised you, yeah, you're not gonna get those. Um, but I do think it's interesting here where a lot of people talk about technology and the glitches and how that's terrible for the little guy. I just think it's really interesting to see an example here of where it's not the little guy. Right. <laughs> so the third headline we've got here, this is from Bloomberg View. And this is Jonathan Weil uh, writing, it's not too early to start worrying about banks again. And what Weil's writing about here is, uh, is provisions and, and banks setting aside money against bad loans. And specifically, he's a little bit concerned that they're not setting aside enough. What do you think? I think it's a reasonable concern. It's easy to say, well, the market's getting better, credit conditions are better. We don't need to set aside enough. And you'd like to give the banks the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, they know what they're doing. They know how much to set aside. But if you look at history, that's not really the case. It's hard to get it exactly right in terms of how much we set aside. So I don't think it's a reason to worry that it's really going to hurt the banks in the long run, hurt the stocks in the long run. But if we do see delinquencies pick up, maybe something, the economy starts to stumble a little bit, it could hurt the banks. I don't think it's a reason to start panicking, though. In terms of metrics, uh, one of the ones that Weil was looking at, or the primary one that Weil was looking at, was provisions, that's loan loss provisions, as a percentage of total loans. Mm -hmm. What I think is, is you've got to look at that in context, and that's the allowances as a percentage of the non-performing loans. So in terms of the non-performing loans, how much are they setting aside? And I actually have a chart here that shows the changes between 2010 in the second quarter of 2013 for these four banks here. So as you can see, provisions as a percentage of loans is falling almost across the board. And then with the exception of Bank of America, you've got loan loss allowances as a percentage of non-performing loans going up across the board. 
So what we have is, is the, the non-performing loans are falling enough that you don't need these huge provisions. Mm -hmm. And so I think what the, what the reserve releases and everything else in recent quarters shows more than anything else was that there was over-provisioning during the crisis and after the crisis, and we're seeing the opposite end of that now. I think it's worth noting, too, the, articles, the article is based on comments from the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, which sure. regulates the yep. banks. Yep. And there's been some criticism that they're not quite hard enough on the banks. So I think this may be the OCC just coming out and saying, hey, we're being a little more critical now. So keep in context who's saying it. Yep. All right, we are going to now move to a review of the past week. We'll do this in rapid fire order. David, start us off. JP Morgan, you, you can't avoid it. Uh, the fines came out, I think $920 million. And it's worth noting that Jamie Dimon, he kind of recognized that there was some lax oversight there. It's been a black eye, but I think they're moving forward. And it's good to see that they're saying, hey, we messed up. We know we messed up. We're gonna try to move forward. And if they can do that, you won't necessarily know it because no bad things will happen, but I think you have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they recognize it, they're moving forward. Fed decision, the Fed surprised everybody not deciding to start the taper quite yet. Uh, one of the groups of companies and, and stocks that this was potentially good for mm -hmm. was the mortgage REITs, particularly those agency-focused uh, mortgage REITs, Annaly Capital and American Capital Agency among them. Both of those stocks jumped after the announcement or non-announcement, whatever you want, but both also cut their dividends, so it turned out to be not such a great week for those investors after all. Absolutely. Next one uh, we're reviewing is the SEC approved a plan to, to show the pay ratio for CEOs, so the pay that CEOs make relative to other employees. I know you're not a big fan of this. You say, what's the point? It's like comparing it's LeBron dumb. James to the towel guy, but I think it's more transparency. I think it it's only a good thing. If they do that, they should compare LeBron James to the towel guy and, and both of their salaries. Next, we got Larry Summers dropping out of the Fed chairman race. I think this was a great, I think this was a good move by Summers. Kudos to him for doing it. And I think this clears the way for my favorite. Janet Yellen. You got it. Your girl. All right, last, last one reviewing was the mid-year stress test that the banks did. It was their own test, so I don't think we were expecting them to fail their own so test. So cynical, David. That would so be a cynical. little bit interesting. The numbers did look good, especially at Bank of America. Tier 1 capital, well above the minimums. Tier 1 leverage ratio, well above the minimums. Looking at the banks, it's hard to say that they're not well capitalized based on what the guidance they've been given. So it's semi-encouraging. It's not like they blew these tests out of the water because they're really hard to do. But it's better than failing them, I guess. Yes, that is true. Earlier this week, David, you and I were in New York City for the Value Investing Congress, mm -hmm. and I wrote an article yesterday <clears throat> looking, <laughs> kind of pulling out themes, pulling out uh, strategy uh, uh, possibilities mm -hmm. from based on the presentations that we saw. So looking, looking at these very accomplished value investors, uh, guys like, uh, like Donald Yakman, guys like uh, Whitney Tilson, mm -hmm. Chris Middleman, uh, and, and trying to pull out, so, so what does their strategy look like based on the presentations? And let me, let me tick off some of the things that I pulled out from these presentations as, as basic pieces of an investment strategy. So pretty much everybody had a company overview in there. And I, I know this sounds very basic, but we're, when we're talking about fundamental investing, that step one in fundamental investing is figuring out what the company does and really what it does. Mm -hmm. So where does it really get its money from? Not just, well, General Mills makes a lot of cereal. You know? uh, number two, global uh, macroeconomic picture. This is sort of a source of contention. There are some folks that still stick to the, to the classic value investing view that it's really tough to predict the macro picture, so don't bother trying to do it. There are others that say now more than ever, this is very important. Uh, there were a lot of themes around the thesis. So it wasn't just an investing thesis. It was what is the theme for this? So is the theme improvements in capital allocation? Is the theme dividends or share buybacks? That sort of thing. Is, it, is the theme acquisitions or um, a change in management? So the theme that goes along with the thesis. There was a, a, lot, a lot of folks, or most of them really, have a reason why the stock is cheap and or what the market doesn't understand or what the market's missing. Uh, there were often catalysts for the change. So, so these were underpriced stocks that they were looking mm -hmm. at. What's the catalyst to get them the full value? 
Uh, there were very few that talked about the moat for the company that they were looking at, but there were a couple that looked at that as well. Uh, there were industry overviews, looking at the industry that the company operates within. And finally, this was a value investing mm -hmm. conference. And so there were a, a lot of folks looking at, or pretty much everybody had a view on the valuation and sh proving or showing that the stock, the company that they were looking at was cheaper than what it's currently trading at. Mm -hmm. So thinking about all this together, David, what is, what is your investing approach? What does your investing strategy look like? And, and did you take anything away? Is there anything you added to your approach from this, uh, from this conference? Right, so you, you ticked, off, ticked off probably, what, six, seven things right there. So it can seem like a lot. Wow, I have to get my head around all of these things. I think it's important if you're out there and looking at an investment, yes, it's important to have all these steps perhaps, but it's also important that you're able to convey this in a couple sentences. I think that's important too. Mm -hmm. You can have a very complicated thesis out there, but unless you can really explain, okay, why am I buying this? Why am I buying it today? And why is it gonna be a good investment for the next five years? Mm -hmm. I think that's important to be able to do in only a couple sentences and not a huge explanation. Well, I'd, I'd say some of the most compelling presentations that we saw were, were compelling because mm -hmm. of their clarity and simplicity. Right. And then the ones that weren't as good were big data dumps, right. where, where the presenter just went through everything you could possibly want to know mm -hmm. about everything. Right. It doesn't have to be this huge, complex data dump. Like you said, if it's a clear, concise thesis, that can work. And going to, to the moats perspective, I think that's interesting because a lot of these guys that presented are very defined value investors in the sense of Graham as opposed to Buffett. And that's really where Buffett is different from Graham, the traditional value investing, is he looked at those businesses with wide moats. If you look at a company like Wells Fargo, Coca-Cola, okay, maybe they're not cheap in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. but Buffett's in them because of those moats. And a lot of the pitches that were given at the Congress, they didn't, like you said, they didn't talk about the moat. They didn't necessarily have a big moat. And I think I kind of disagreed with that. I think you do have to have the moat perspective in there. You can't just have a business as, okay, there's profit to, for realization in the valuation mm -hmm. and also profit margins. But if the profit margins aren't protected by anything, it's not gonna last long. So a lot of these can be great one-year investments. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the perspective that some of the presenters were looking at. But if we're talking about foolish investing five, 10 years, I think you do have to consider that moat. It's interesting that you say that about the moat and about the, the profit margins because Donald Yakman fielded a question about Apple and yep. he's, he's, kinda, he's bearish on Apple. And one of the things that he talked about was he looks at the huge margins that Apple has as a threat to the company mm -hmm. so that the stock looks cheap today but that those margins are A, attractive to competitors, and B, not necessarily defendable. Mm -hmm. So he said specifically, he thinks that Samsung is going to eat Apple's mm -hmm. lunch. So that kind of underscores the importance of, of having a moat. Mm -hmm. um, now, there, there are plenty of arguments that Apple does have that, but Yakman, who, pretty good investor, mm -hmm. uh, seems to think that Apple does not. Absolutely. So putting the pieces together, uh, were there any were there any specific pitches? Were there any specific ideas that jumped out at you from the conference uh, in these frameworks? Specific companies, not necessarily. Mainly because a lot of these companies are not the apples of the world, not Coca Cola. These aren't companies that we hear about every day. So I'm not necessarily comfortable enough to say, "Wow, that sounds good." I'm listening to one pitch right. and going to buy it. So I think you would need to do a little bit more digging on some of these. The ones that had. Um, a longer time frame were a little bit more interesting to me. I just mentioned some were only looking one year out, two years out. I think that makes sense for what they're trying to accomplish in, mm -hmm. in some respects, but I also, there was one presenter, his name escapes me right now, he was talking about India mm -hmm. and just the country of India and where the investment opportunities are in that country. And he was saying, hey, let's take the long view on this. What's India gonna look like the next 20? Yeah, a long, long view. The next 20 years. So. I, I tended to side with someone who was taking that type of view to say, hey, let's look 20 years out. Where is the value today? So that was one that's just interesting. Maybe not necessarily going out and buying an Indian bank today, but that got on my radar, maybe to dig more into that. So, so here, let, let, me, let me tick off. This is sort of uh, how my investing approach kind of works. And it, in some ways, it, it mirrors what these guys were doing. So starting off with a company overview, obviously. And then as part of that, but also separately, I want to look at financial strength mm -hmm. because that's going to dictate the real risk there. The risk to me, as a lot of other value investors have talked about, the risk isn't the ups and downs of the stocks. It's the risk of real loss. Mm -hmm. And so a company that isn't financially strong 
gives you more of a chance of, of something happening that will give you a real loss. I want to know about management. I want to I, I want to know about the three most important things, and I'll come back to that in a second. I want to look at that moat that we're just mm -hmm. talking about. I want to I want to know what the market is missing because if you are investing in a stock that you believe is undervalued, like legitimately undervalued and worth buying, the market must be missing something. And if you can't figure out what that is, you may be wrong. You're probably wrong, actually. So, so I want to know, what is it that the market is missing or overlooking or overblowing or something? What is the market getting wrong? And then finally, I'm, I'm looking at valuation. And this isn't a single number. Uh, this isn't a single metric. This is a, an evaluation exercise to how much could this be worth over time? And when I look at it over various scenarios, what's the upside? What's the downside? What's my risk? What's my opportunity? So it's not just saying, oh, I think this stock is worth $50, so it's a buy. Now coming back really quickly to finish off here with that three most important things. This, is a, this goes back to something that Marty Whitman, uh, another great value investing investor, not, not at the con Congress though, mm -hmm. but he said at one point that usually it's three or four things that are very important and outside of that, uh, it's just mostly noise or, or, or a lot of noise. And so this, this is something that I look at. And yesterday on this show, I was pitching AIG as the next stock that I'm going to, to purchase for my real money portfolio for The Motley Fool. And I looked at the three most important things. So these are generally going to be the things that I think are going to mm -hmm. have the greatest opportunity to propel the company forward. And again, to review that with AIG, it's that continuing cleaning up of the, the crisis problem, which basically is over. And so I'm gonna knock that one off the list pretty soon. It's the combined ratio at the property and casualty mm -hmm. insurance, that's such a big piece of the business. And then it's the uh, assets under management growth at the life and retirement business, which is another fairly sizable piece of AIG's business. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to our game for today, we've got some investing chicken. <laughs> and today, we're going to be visiting with Bank of America. Mm -hmm. So David, I will start you off with a challenge here. First scenario, Bank of America splits itself up into a commercial bank, a consumer bank, an investment bank. Are you holding or are you selling? Holding, for sure. Not selling in that, in that scenario at all. This is a very, very complex bank to manage, to work for. Uh, with those separate entities, I think there could be a lot more clarity, and I think they could actually realize more value in the long run. Okay. All right, my first scenario for you is the $8.5 billion settlement that's proposed with Bank of New York Mellon and all those other investors through that is rejected, and they're forced to pay substantially more, maybe double. What are your thoughts? <sighs> double, double. Double. Double I'm actually probably okay with. Okay. More than double, I start to get uneasy. Double, I'm probably okay with. Brian Moynihan has said this, and I believe it. Is Bank of America has huge earnings potential, earnings power over time, and so I think they make that up. That it'll hit the company, but I'm okay with that. Number two for you, management decides to curtail credit card lending. That's not a big deal. It's a. It's not a huge portion of their business. It's profitable but it wasn't too profitable a couple of years ago. Um, it, it's, it's a big part of their consumer strategy in terms of getting the deposits, getting the mortgage, getting the credit card. So it's just one slice of the pie. It would certainly take a hit to profits, but it certainly wouldn't make me sell the whole stock. It'd be an odd strategy though, wouldn't it? All right, we'll move on to my next one for you. Fee revenue. So all those fees, credit card fees, deposit fees, investment banking fees, they got a lot of fee revenue over there. Continuous decline in fee revenue over the next one, two years, when Wells Fargo and JP Morgan see an increase in fee revenue. So Bank of America, the core business, not doing too hot. Why, why, is, that, why, why is that happening? Lack of execution, lack of customer appreciation there. So oh, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I, could, I could start thinking about selling in mm -hmm. that scenario because the, the, the whole thesis here is that this is a good core bank. It's got to shake off the, the expenses and the problems from the financial crisis and, and move ahead and show that core business. If that core business isn't performing, then you, your thesis is basically shot. Fair All right, enough. number three for you, the stock trades up to two times tangible book value. And Buffett, who through Berkshire Hathaway has a, has a derivative, has a, has a preferred position mm -hmm. in Bank of America, liquidates the entire position, it just gets rid of it. Well, I'm actually going to jump the gun and reveal my third one, too. It was 
Optimism pushes the stock above two times tangible book value with the caveat that it is a higher valuation than JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. So let's tackle this together. I would be selling at that point. The bank, the history of the bank was solid before the financial crisis. Coming through it, I don't know if they're gonna get to the levels of returns that really justify a valuation higher than JP Morgan and Wells Fargo in the near future. Let, 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 me, let me cut I'm you off there. If, I'm if, selling there. If, if there are not very, very materially positive changes to the business, there's no way that I would rather own Bank of America than either of those other two, mm -hmm. JP Morgan or Wells Fargo, if Bank of America's tangible book value valuation is higher than both of those. All right. All right, finishing off the day and the week as we always do with Twitter. David, give us the first one. First tweet. J.P. Morgan, what else from David Shile? Sandler, the J.P. Morgan settlement represents less than 2% of our 2014 EPS estimate and less than 0.5% of current tangible book value. So the median income for the U.S. family is what, $55,000? Let's say it is. A 2% fine would be like paying, let's say it's 55. Let's say it. It would be like paying a $1,000 fine. So in that scenario, if you're the average family, a $1,000 fine. That hurts. That hurts for a month or so. But in the long run, you're probably going to forget about it. It's not going to damage the, the family. I feel like there's bad. some, aren't are there some speeding tickets or, or, or moving violations that could run you back that much? So yeah, it's, it, just, it just highlights that this makes headlines. It hurts for a little bit. But in the long run, we're not even going to be talking about this in five years. It's not going to dent the bank that much. All right, number two tweet. We've got Tom Jacobs, our own Tom Jacobs, at, at Tom Jacobs Invest. He says, many an optimist has become rich by buying out a pessimist. That is from Robert G. Allen, an author and real estate investor. David, what pessimists are you buying out today? Hopefully you. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow that quote up with another quote. So we talked about Warren Buffett earlier in the show. He was on Georgetown campus yesterday talking with Brian Moynihan, Bank of America CEO. And Buffett said, I consider the luckiest person on a probabilistic basis that ever lived is the baby that's born today in the US. If that's not optimism, I don't know what is. He, he you get, Buff Buffett's a continual optimist, and it's hard to disagree with him. I mean, we're talking about the taper, we're talking about the economy not growing super fast right now. He said, okay, look, if GDP is growing at 2%, population growing at 1%, net net, we're, we're still growing GDP per capita over the next 20 years, we're gonna make a lot of progress. So. Let's be optimist. You're getting mu you're a little mushy on me there. I I'm going to be more specific, and I'm going to say that there's optimism, I think, in a lot of parts of the stock market right now. If you look at valuations, there are a lot of full valuations. I still don't see that in the banking and financial sector broadly. So I'm happy to be the optimist buying out some of the pessimists on mm -hmm. banks, particularly when you talk about J.P. Morgan in the news all the time, Bank of America with all of its problems. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of fans, but there are also a lot of pessimists. All right, moving on to our last tweet. Got a little Olive Garden from Paul LaMonica at LaMonica Buzz. Never ending woes for Olive Garden? Darden down 5%. Red Lobster is not for the stock lover in you. He links out to a video there. Not a great quarter for Darden. We usually don't talk about restaurants, but this tweet caught my eye. Big earnings miss. COO to retire. Same store sales down. This is a restaurant that focuses on basically the, the middle class. Not doing too great. I guess the never ending pasta bowl is starting to end maybe. So my question for you is, if you could have a never ending bowl of something, food, not food, what would it be? All right, for fans of, of, our, of our other shows, uh, Market Foolery, uh, Motley Fool Money, probably talking, heard me talk about Cafe Rio before, it would be Cafe Rio's Tostada with the cilantro lime vinaigrette. If I could have a never ending bowl of that, I would die a happy man. How about Fair you? enough. I was under the weather earlier this week not under the weather anymore because I went to Whole Foods. I got some of their chicken noodle soup. <laughs> Man, that is some... You're going to go with that even when you're not sick? All the time? Keep it as reserves. Chicken. Build build those <laughs> reserves for when I'm sick. So it'll be good. Because that is that is the medicine of the future. Of course. Again, as always, you can tweet at us. We are at TMF Financials. Tweet us your questions, comments. And we'll look at them right here on the show. All right, folks. That is the show for today and for the week. Come back and see us next week. David here will be pitching one of his favorite investments. Thanks for watching. We will see you then.